And God writes in verse 1, speaks, and says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended His work which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had done. And so after six days God ceases on the seventh day, not from working, period, but from His creative work. He continues to work, and sometimes there's the idea that God has just created the heavens and the earth and then cast it out, and it's going to run its due course, but really He doesn't uh, involve Himself too much more with what it is that we're doing and what it is that we're involved in. We're doing such a fine job, you know. And uh, we're just kind of getting things ship-shape, ready to have the kingdom ready for Him just to appear and take over, you know. Uh, just got to get all Christians elected, you know, and that kind of thing. And I have tongue firmly planted in cheek related to that. But His work does continue. He ceased His creative work. His work of redemption uh, was something that continues to this day as He works through the finished work of Jesus Christ in people's lives. Jesus spoke Himself and said, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working also. And so Jesus uh, and the Father continued to work. And then God blessed the seventh day and He sanctified it. He declared it holy because in it He rested from all His work which God had created and made. And so the seventh day was a day of rest. And I'm not going to get into the Sabbath tonight. We'll wait until we get into the law of Moses as it relates to that and the fact that we don't observe the Sabbath. Oh, let's get into it for a second. <laughs> I was talking with someone this morning related to it. And I'm from Napa, which is Seventh-day Adventist country. And so the seventh day is a rather large uh, issue to an awful lot of people. So why, why do we worship on Sunday instead of Saturday? Uh, basically to bug Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> there you have it. Okay, now let's move on. Uh, you you want to know the real reason? Well, you know, the spiritual reason is because that was the, the day that um, the Christians in the early church met together on the, on the day of Jesus' resurrection. And we see that in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We also see it in um, Acts chapter 20 as they gather on the first day of the week and that kind of thing. But really, the reason we do is it's the day that most people have off in our culture. And uh, it tells us in, in the book of Romans that uh, one man esteems a certain day above another. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventists do. Uh, some of the apostolic churches do. God bless them. If uh, Saturday is a bigger day than Wednesday or Sunday, terrific. But Paul goes on to say that others esteem every day alike. We esteem every day equally important. Wednesday, I don't walk any less close with God on Wednesday than I do on Sunday. I don't worship Him to any lesser of a degree. I spend less time in these gray chairs during the week than I do on Sunday. But in terms of my relationship with God, it's, it's every day. And so he, he just speaks very clearly that that's not to be a big deal, not to be a big issue. We don't put down those who worship on a Friday or a Saturday or a Tuesday or whatever, but neither are they to put down those who uh, worship on, on a Sunday. And the Sabbath is Jesus came. He was the fulfillment of the law. The law was a taskmaster. It was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ, to make you look at the law and realize if this is what I must do to be righteous in the eyes of God, and I've already failed a million and one times already, then I think I'd better find a salvation. And so then I'm pointed by the Holy Spirit unto Jesus Himself. And so once I am in Christ, I no longer have the need of the tutor or the schoolmaster of the law. One of the great failures as it relates to elevating the seventh day or the Sabbath or the Saturday above all other days is that it is usually done uh, associated with the Ten Commandments. The idea is that uh, somehow we are still under the Ten Commandments. We are not, and I'm not going to get into it any more fully than I already have. But Paul writes in his epistles, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and says, those of you who want to go back under the law, he said, have you read the law? Uh, 
Have you uh, sacrificed something for your first male child? Uh, did, you, did you do that? Are you careful not to travel more than a certain distance on the Sabbath day? Do you never light a fire on the Sabbath day? Go back under the law. Um, do you handle leprosy and its proper procedures as it, as it relates to running into these things and, uh, and all of the things that we could get very graphic related to, but we will not. Now, if, and the fact of the matter is we don't, but you can't just isolate the Sabbath off and say, well, we keep that, but we're under grace everywhere else. It doesn't work. So... Let's move on. It's bondage. It's just bondage. And I'm free. And so he sanctified it. And Jesus fulfilled it, by the way. Let's not leave it just yet. Let's not leave it before the pinnacle. And the fact of the matter is he's fulfilled the Sabbath. Sabbath means rest. He is our rest. There, there's, no, there's no rest in a day. I, we work harder on Saturday than probably any other day of the week. Uh, a lot of us. And so, um, it, but it was a picture of the rest that was going to come in Jesus Christ. And the rest that we have in Him. And uh, you can refer to Hebrews as it relates to that. Then he begins in verse 4. And now he's going to give us a little more insight into the things that he gave us kind of an overview of in chapter 1. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the heavens, uh, the earth and the heavens. Before any plant of the field was on in the earth and before any herb of uh, the field uh, had grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground." Now, we need to understand this a little bit just, just for the sake of understanding the magnitude of what it was that Noah did when we get to him. But apparently in this particular time prior to the flood, there was no such thing as rain. Uh, the earth was not watered through rain. There was a mist that came up, and it, and it appears because of the longevity of their lives, they lived hundreds of years, that somehow there was some kind of a a uh, atmospheric covering as it related to planet Earth that was far stronger and greater and perhaps that or perhaps other reasons for the longevity of man, but, but somehow a canopy that really protected the Earth. And, it, and there, so there was a, a, a watering that occurred that way. There was no rain. It was watered uh, and it watered the face of, of all of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Kind of a lowly beginning, wouldn't you say? He takes us and, and he, just, he forms us out of the dust of the earth. There's nothing more common than that, is there? Nothing more common than dirt, than, than soil, than earth. And the reason that you and I are, are of value as human beings because we've been created in the image of God and because we have the breath of God. We have life from God in us. And if we are in Christ Jesus, we have fellowship with God. How valuable is your body once that breath is gone? Uh, you're, a, you're a liability at that point. You're very expensive. Whether we cremate you or bury you, you are expensive at that particular point. Nobody says, oh boy, you know, more bodies, more soil and green. Nobody does anything like that. Some of your oldies, I can tell. As if that was a BC movie. I just need to let you know. I don't know quite what was all about it. It was a little gross there at the end, but um, I'm not uh, advocating it as a movie. But, but the fact is, is that it is because of His life in us that, that there, is, there is value to our life. And I think it's important, too, to understand that life is a stewardship. Life is a gift. Life is a wonderful thing. Now, I can be kind of a... I can, I can have a tendency, I know you're going to be shocked, I can have a tendency to look at more of the uh, melancholy side of life and examine it a little more fully than perhaps I ought to. But I enjoy life. I really do enjoy life. I enjoy ice cream. I enjoy yogurt. I enjoy food. I enjoy Manteca water slides. I enjoy friendship with people and all kinds of things. And life is wonderful. And, it, and it's a gift that is given to us uh, by God, and, and we are of value because of His presence in our life. That's what we've been created for. 
You take His life out of us. You take the fullness of what we've been created for and intended for, and we are a liability. We are a liability to ourselves. We are a liability to the rest of mankind. We are a liability to this planet. And uh, if you don't believe that, uh, just grab a newspaper sometime and read it. Notice again in verse 7 that the Lord God formed man. Huh? Again, he's, as he pounded and pounded and pounded and pounded in chapter 1, no evolution. He's not an evolutionist. He created man. He formed man. And the Lord God planted a garden. I like gardens. And I like to see gardens that people know how to plant gardens when they plant a garden. It's really something to see. Beautiful. Can you imagine the garden that God planted? He planted a garden. Wow. It would really be tremendous. And it was, it was really uh, quite nice. There's plenty of water and all. He, he, he details. He's quite proud of this garden, by the way. It's, it was really something. And he created it for man. And he planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Eden means a delight, and it surely it was. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Two types of trees. Fruit trees and trees that just look good. So, guilt-free. When you plant a tree and you think, oh, I should plant fruit trees. Something that really redeems itself and all. I feel guilty. I just plant these things that are just beautiful. No, he planted trees that were beautiful, planted trees that brought forth fruit. He was into all of them, provided both kinds. And the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We'll get to them in just a moment. Now, a river went out of Eden to water the garden and from there it parted and became four river heads. So, Four rivers that, that fed the garden. That's better than my garden. I have no garden. I have soaker hoses. And the name of the first was Hushim. And it is the one which encompasses the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Hushim. And the onyx stone are there. And the name of the second river is Gihon. I hate these names. And it is the one which encompasses the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is... And it is the one which goes towards the east of Assyria. Probably the Tigris uh, River. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. And then the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. He always intended man to work. Work is not a curse. Now, to be sure, work was not as hard in the Garden of Eden as it is today, trying to get something out of that soil and, and to uh, provide a living. But it was always intended that, God, that man would work and that he would work as unto God and that he would minister to God uh, in this way. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Oh! Every one of them, the whole thing. I don't know how big this garden is, but if you take that, you know, uh, Mesopotamia and that whole region of the Tigris Euphrates rivers, that's a very big and fertile valley. All the trees, the fruit of all of it, it's all yours. It's, I mean, he, he says yes to an awful lot. And then he says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And so the question arises, why in the world did God create that tree? Why did He put that tree in the middle of that garden? Why did He have to go and do that and then we know what comes out of it? Why did that have to be placed there? And when God created Adam, He created Adam with the idea of having fellowship with him. And God had the desire that the fellowship that He would have with man would be meaningful fellowship. And in order for fellowship to be meaningful, in order for that to be there, there needs to be the power of self-determination or the power of choice. Otherwise... It's not a meaningful relationship. You can't have a meaningful re relationship with a robot. You can't have a meaningful relationship with someone who is forced 
to have a relationship with you that has no alternative, has no choice. So there needed to be the power of self-determination. There needed to be a choice. And not only did there need to be a choice, or the power of choice, but there needed to be a choice. And so God takes and He puts in this garden a choice. A choice to obey Him and have fellowship with Him, or a choice to disobey Him and break fellowship with Him. If there was no choice in the garden, then fellowship with God and and giving uh, importance and significance to that would be a moot point. It would not be significant fellowship. It wouldn't be valid. And so not only is it necessary to have the power of choice, but I must be provided a choice. Not only must I be provided a choice, but I must be provided an attractive choice. And He provided an attractive choice in this tree. And I bet it was a beautiful tree. And I bet the fruit of it was very beautiful. In fact, we know it was because Eve, a little bit later on, she's going to look at it and she comes to the conclusion that this is very good. And so if he put some tree in the middle of the garden that had some slimy, gushy fruit, uh, you know, just fruit that when you got within 50 yards of it, flies just started going all over the place, and the stench of it was terrible, and he came up to you and said, now listen, I don't want you to eat of that. Well, there'd hardly be any choice. I wouldn't dream of eating it. And so it was necessary that there would not only be the choice, but that it would also be an attractive choice. And God takes it one step further. Not only did He allow the choice to be attractive, but He allowed Satan to exploit the attractiveness of the choice. And He allowed him to come to Adam and Eve with that uh, attempt to exploit them. And so... For Adam and Eve to continue to say no to that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, to have the the power to choose, to have a choice to choose related to it, to have a choice that was attractive, and then to uh, choose not to have anything to do with that, uh, even with Satan tempting them as it relates to the attractiveness of that choice. Well, for Adam and Eve to do that, it would have been very meaningful to God as it related to their relationship with Him. And that's what makes our relationship, among other things, very meaningful to Him. Because we have been given the capacity of choice. And you and I do have choices. We're exercising a choice tonight to be here. And the choices that are brought forward to us every single day are attractive choices to our flesh. And not only they are attractive, but Satan comes in and tries to exploit the attractiveness of that which is forbidden by God. And so when we say no to those things in order to maintain communion and fellowship with God, it is meaningful to God. And finally, as it relates to this whole choice issue, and probably the heaviest thing related to it altogether, is that for choice to be valid, There must be an honoring of the choice that is made. One of the most heavy things on the face of this planet is that God holds valid the choices that men make concerning Himself. He does not violate their free will. He allows them to choose and He honors their choice. And so the option was given in order for fellowship to be meaningful and for it to be as meaningful as God intended it both for man and for himself. And he warned not to partake of this tree, not to, uh, uh, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for he said, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now you'll excuse me if you were at the Christmas program last year and you bore with me as it relates to the illustration, but I think it's the best illustration happening, so I'm going to do it again for you. The Bible teaches that we were created in the image of God. And I believe that what he meant by that is that God is a trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he created man an inferior trinity of spirit uppermost, soul, and body. 
And God has chosen to have fellowship with man in the realm of the Spirit. And so that's how we commune with Him, in the realm of the Spirit. And so when Adam and Eve partake of that fruit in the next chapter, God says here, in the day of it that you eat of it, you will surely die. And yet they did not die that day. The fact that you and I are sitting here is proof of that. Well, how did they die on that day? They died spiritually. And fellowship was broken off with God. They died spiritually that day. In fact, it's worse than just this. Their whole world then turned upside down and now rather than being dominated by the Spirit or even being dominated by the emotion and the intellect, the soul, man is now dominated by his body. And he runs as an, as an animal dominated by the body appetites. And so what is needed to correct this situation? What is the great need of mankind? It is just what Jesus said was our need, and that was to be born again by the Holy Spirit, a spiritual birth, and when that occurs, I can again have fellowship and communion with God. Unless a man be born again, he shall in no wise inherit the kingdom of God, the necessity of the spiritual birth, because it was a spiritual death that occurred on that day when we get to it in Genesis chapter 3. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. Yes, indeed. And I will make him a helper comparable to him. So now he's going to establish this wonderful institution and covenant called marriage. And he looks at man, and he's very wise. He's quite a bit wiser than us, infinitely wiser. But any of us can look at the average man who is, does not have the gift of celibacy, let's say, in the body of Christ, and look at him and say, it's not good that they be alone. I think I'm going to pray for the, the woman that is just right for them from God. But God looks at man and says, it's not good for man to be alone. And so he says, I'm going to create for him a helper like man, a helpmate. That's what he calls the woman here as he's about to create her. Now, Sometimes the women don't like that. Oh, you get a little hung up on that. And this is 1993, and I know we're, you know, we're fierce and we're feminists and we're in your face and this kind of stuff. <laughs> I heard that on a radio show. That's a crack up to me. But that doesn't go over real big today. But, and it looks like, you know, boy, God, he's a second class citizen. No, 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 that's not what he's saying. He looks at man and he says, that guy needs help. And then he looks and he says, I'm going to create a helper for him in woman. I mean, nobody comes out of this thing clean. It's, it's, a one, it's, it's an observation that only the Creator can make. We need help. And she's been created to help. And I don't care about all of the marches and all of the this and all of the that as it relates to freedom from one another and taking away the distinction between the sexes and all of that kind of stuff. The fact of the matter is that it's not good for men to dwell alone. And they know that. The fact of the matter is you look at the average woman, the blessing of her life is to be a helper to a man who loves her like Christ loves the church. The problem is, is that the difficulty of finding such a man uh, that ho who won't violate... Uh, that yearning in their heart to be that and to do that and, and, to, and to have that recompensed with that kind of a love. But, but deep down in all of us, that's, that's the desire, that's the need, that's what we've been created for and that's, what, and, and that's what she's been created for too. And I think that, you know, sometimes, you know, where there's this violent opposition to the way that God has made us, uh, I think oftentimes it's a good idea to look sometimes at, at what is the bruise in my life that produces that kind of an opposition. If somebody's got a huge bruise on their arm. Somebody gets near that bruise. It's like, ooh, ooh, you know, it's, it's an overreaction related to it. And so sometimes there's this heavy overreaction to what are they saying? And you know, oftentimes you're dealing with a, a, a person who's been greatly hurt, been very, very damaged. But it doesn't mean that God didn't know what He was talking about. It doesn't mean that He didn't fail in His observations of, of man and of woman. 
It means that you're, deal, you're living in a sinful world. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was his name, part of his having dominion. He names them. And so Adam gave names to all of the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. He looked at all of these beasts and there wasn't a wife among them. (laughs) Not a suitable, you know, all of them. Just uh, even on a blind date, uh, just (laughs) just be a nightmare. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And the Lord took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And then the rib, close to Adam's heart, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And then I love these words, and he brought her to the man. The first marriage. The first marriage. And she is a gift. To Adam. And I think that the women that God give, gives to us is, a, is, a, uh, our, is next to His Son, Jesus Christ, the greatest gift that He gives us. It's just tremendous. Tremendous gift that He gives us in our wives. Really something. And I think it is so important. And I, and I speak to the men. Uh, all, of you, all of you women just go, uh, you, but... It's so important to treat her that way. So important to treat her that way. I have found one of the key ingredients to a healthy marriage is just good mutual respect towards one another as human beings. And respect for the fact that that is a daughter of the Lord and that is a son of the Lord and to deal with one another on that kind of a level. And so here he, he receives this gift and he is, he is uh, uh, just thrilled. <laughs> and Adam said... This, versus the giraffe and the zebra and all of that, this is now bone of my bones. Yes, this I recognize. Uh, This looks familiar and looks delightful. And this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And the word woman means out of man. And there is no truth to the rumor that it means he looked at her and said, Woo, man! (laughs) It's an old joke, but I can never pass it up. I'm sorry. (laughs) And therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, speaking of marriage, and be joined or cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And I love this joined together, this cleave together, because what it speaks of in the Hebrew is a joining that is so tight... And, and with such permanence that to break the bond is to do great damage to both parts. And, uh, and that, is the, that is true. That is true. And so they are to leave the influence of father and mother in terms of the supremacy of them in the household and establish their own unit and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and the wife, and were not ashamed. So a period of great purity, great innocence. And now...